a fully pro-life ethic is more than just being anti-abortion, but it's never less. So you can't skip ahead to the other pro-life human dignity issues and not be for the unborn. At the same time, I think our ethic of the unborn, that, that there's human, that the most vulnerable among us have dignity and worth, should shape the way we view other things. Christians in the West are generally in agreement that abortion is morally wrong. It's something even Catholics and Southern Baptists can agree on. But where that movement splinters is over what we should do about it. Should we be advocating for government regulation or for adoption? Should we be teaching abstinence or providing birth control? Should we fund lobbyists or pregnancy crisis centers? Here today to help us explore this issue is Daniel Darling, director of the Land Center for Cultural Engagement at Southwestern Seminary. Dan, thanks for joining us. I'm glad to be here. So abortion has been in the news cycle on and off for decades, but it's recently arisen to particular prominence with this latest case, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. What is this case and what is its significance? So this is the case of a, the state of Mississippi passed a law that restricted abortion after 15 weeks. Um, 15 weeks is a, is a marker uh, for many with just with the updated science that uh, you know, babies in the womb feel pain before 15 weeks. They start developing some characteristics, characteristics like DNA um, and quite a few other things, uh, some of their senses of touch and things. Science has really shown us a window into the womb that uh, by this time there's a lot of um, things that they've developed. Uh, and so it's a way for the state of Mississippi to say, let's not have abortions past this time. Um, it, it is a, it, it's really the first major threat to Roe versus Wade uh, since the Casey decision in 1992. And it, 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 it's a direct strike at Roe in a couple of ways. Number one, it goes at the viability issue. You know, because Roe versus Wade initially uh, uh, was not, you know, the, the, the law was not about viability. But uh, when the Casey decision, it became about when is a, a baby viable outside the womb. Um, this one kind of goes at that and says, is that a good standard? Um, it's also a direct challenge to Roe. Uh, the, the state in their, in their, you know, filings basically challenge the legitimacy and the constitutionality of Roe versus Wade. So it's a major case. Uh, the Supreme Court has an opportunity. The fact that they took up the case and they had oral arguments means that the court intends to, to make a ruling on this. So it'll be a significant ruling either way. So let's say that this case does end up finding Roe versus Wade unconstitutional. What happens next? So really, if, if as, as pro-life activists really hope for, and this is what we've been working for for almost 50 years, the, the pro-life movement has, has been steady, has been present, has not gone away like many thought they would after 1973, um, this is a big day. If, if the court uh, decides against Roe and strikes down Roe versus Wade, it's really the beginning of pro-life work, not the end, because this sends the decisions back to the states. So then the states each can decide the level of restrictions they want. So some states will pass uh, big restrictions, probably outlaw abortion completely, because they have more of a conservative majority in their legislatures and conservative governors. Other states like, you know, New York, California, Illinois, might go the other way and, you know, enact the most liberal uh, abortion laws. And so then the fight goes state by state uh, to really make the case state by state uh, on, on uh, why abortion should be illegal. So we know that for a lot of women, abortion is a financial decision, that mm. they are in a position where they have been convinced that abortion is their only option in order to avoid poverty. So if Roe versus Wade were overturned and abortion did become, if not completely, completely illegal, more illegal, where could we expect to see the pressures of poverty increase in our society? Well, I mean, first of all, um, we have to make a, a, the case that uh, to mothers in crisis that uh, abortion is not the only option. And, and actually, on the ground, many are doing that right now. Crisis pregnancy centers all over the country, um, Christians all over the country speaking up on a, a variety of issues. But uh, it, it will be important for the church to be ready, 
for Christians to be ready to say, do we have the infra infrastructure to um, support mothers in crisis? Because you're right, for a lot of women, um, the father is not around, they're on their own. Um, there, there's great um, pressure and marketing and social pressure in society to say your only option, your best option is to abort your baby. Um, and I think the church has to come along and say, no, there's other options here. We want to help you raise your child. We also, we also need to communicate the message that um, children are not an inconvenience. Children are not an impediment to flourishing. That being a parent is not um, something that happens to you. It's, it, it's an opportunity. It's a gift. Uh, one of the messages that out there that is really, I think, toxic is this idea that a child is a, is a, is a speed bump on the road to your success. Mm -hmm. That's an impediment to success, impediment to the flourishing of women, impediment to the flourishing of families. And actually, um, we need to make the case that women who, who carry their children to term and who become mothers can have a flourishing life, that they can have a meaningful life. Uh, as both a mother and, uh, you know, a, a citizen and, and in their career as well. So about 900,000 children are aborted every year in America. So how could we prepare as the church? If Roe versus Wade is overturned, we're going to have 900,000 new mm -hmm. lives in our country. How can we prepare right now so that they come into a world that is ready to welcome them? Well, I think th this is a great challenge for the church, right? Um, now, first of all, we need to say, Number one, we want to welcome 900,000 lives. And we have to have the ethic and, and the worldview that says more children and more people are not a problem, right? Uh, if you think of, about what Genesis talks about, uh, being fruitful and multiplying, if you think about the Bible never looks at, at more people, as, it never looks at humanity as a problem, you know? that, And so 900,000 more human beings... We should welcome that. That's a beautiful thing. But we do need to be there to welcome children into the world, um, as, we, as we need to be right now. You know, we, we live in a society where there's great breakdown of the family. Most kids growing up today don't grow up with a flourishing uh, a family with a mother and father. And the church has to be the place where, where those people find refuge and find welcome, um, where they find in the church surrogate mothers and fathers, where they find in the church mentors, uh, people to come alongside them. And I think mothers in crisis need this, where if, if, if a mother in crisis sees that there's a community waiting for them to, to help them in this journey of raising their child, I think there's, there's a much more likely dec decision that they'll, that they'll keep their, their, their child. Um, and really all of us need that, not just single mothers, not just mothers in crisis, all of us who are parents, we know we can't raise our kids by ourselves. We know we need a flourishing community. We need a church community. Come alongside us and help us with this. And so I think the church is uniquely positioned to answer the crisis. I do think we're going to need a lot more crisis pregnancy centers, so we need to use our resources for that. I think we're going to need to think holistically about health care, uh, especially for, for those uh, under the poverty line, those who are the working poor. Uh, I think we need to think about how to take care of basic needs, like diapers and, and food and all that. But, you know, the church is equipped to do this. You know, God has put us here in this moment. So the end of legal abortion and 900,000 more uh, children entering the world is not a, is not a problem. It's, it's an opportunity. Yeah. And the church is uniquely poised. God has made us for this moment. Yeah. Well, one of the perennial critiques of the pro-life movement is that it's selective. We're very excited about the idea of a child being born, but we're less committed to the kind of activities you're talking about that ensure that life after birth is one of flourishing. Is that a valid critique? See, I think, I think there's a couple things going on with that critique. I think, number one, um, I don't know that it's fair because m most of the pro-life people I know are, are really on the ground in communities doing all these things, right? So a lot of studies show that the most, uh, the people who give the most of their money are conservative pro-life people. They give money to, you know, charity, to NGOs, they sponsor children. Um, 
I also think that's kind of used as a weapon against the pro-life ethic to say, well, you don't agree with me on this, this, and that public policy, so therefore your, your policy of pro-life is invalid. But the question we're asking with the pro-life movement is simple. Is the baby in the womb a human being? And if they're a human being, do they deserve life? Um, just because there's some inconsistencies over here, perhaps, does not invalidate the humanity of the baby. So I think that's an unfair critique. That being said, um, I think we do have room to grow and room for improvement. And I think a fully pro-life ethic is not, is, is, is uh, I like to say that a fully pro-life ethic is more than just being anti-abortion, but it's never less. So you can't skip ahead to the other pro-life human dignity issues and not be for the unborn. At the same time, I think our ethic of the unborn, that, that there's human, that the most vulnerable among us have dignity and worth, should shape the way we view other things. It should shape the way we view our neighbors. It should shape the way we view uh, however you feel about public policy on immigration, how we feel about immigrants, uh, how we feel about refugees, how we think about um, all sorts of issues. And good Christians will disagree, mm. right, on things like healthcare or things like economics, right? What's the most prudent thing? But our pro-life ethic should at least have us caring about the poor and caring about these issues. And I think most pro-life people are there, but I do think, you know, there's some critique that might be worth listening to and saying, okay, what are other areas where we can ad ad apply our pro-life uh, principles? Well, you've mentioned crisis pregnancy centers a couple times. These have been a standard area of work for evangelicals for yeah. decades now. What exactly happens at a crisis pregnancy center? See, I, I you know, pro-life pregnancy centers are really, the people who work in these centers are really heroes. You know, um, there are people on the ground in communities across this country who really care about young women in crisis. And not, you know, they're, the, the volunteers and staff at pro-life pregnancy centers are not just doing this to make a pro-life point. They are. But they're actually doing it because they genuinely care about young women and the difficult decisions they make. And you want to talk about um, people who are living out their, their faith and really saving, saving young women and saving babies. Um, and uh, typically what happens, and you know, there's all kinds of pregnancy centers, um, but for the most part, what happens is they're a resource for young women to think through their options of uh, what to do with an unwanted pregnancy and have a lot of resources, whether it's um, training on parenting, whether it's getting plugged into a church community that can help them with physical resources like diapers and, and uh, formula and all the things that you need. Um, some are pretty, some of these pro-life pregnancy centers are very robust and offer health care. There's, there's a growing number of them that are offering holistic health care options for, for those who can't afford health care. Um, many of them have ultrasound machines so that a mother could actually see an ultrasound of, of her baby. And typically when they see an ultrasound, uh, there's a high likelihood, I think it's 80, 90% uh, where they choose life. And so uh, they're doing incredible work. I think we're gonna continue to need uh, pregnancy resource centers, even if Roe versus Wade is overturned. I think we're gonna need them even more because we're gonna face mothers with even you know, more mothers with more uh, crisis pregnancy. Well, it's very vogue in conservative circles to become very passionate about pro-life issues during election cycles. What can regular everyday believers do today, though, to support women in crisis in their communities, regardless of what legislation decides? Right. That's a great point. I mean, on the one hand, I do think it's very important for Christians to, to speak out and to vote. Uh, you know, voting is a difficult decision but vote uh, in ways that, uh, you know, that to have their vote be informed by biblical ethic. So I do think politics is important. I think um, applying your pro-life principles to politics is very important. That being said, if we're only pro-life every four years, come election time or every two years, are we really pro-life? I think those things are important. But if you really wanna, you know, live out your pro-life, if you're really burdened by the issue of abortion, as we should be. The, the best way you can help today, like right now, 
like regardless of who's in office, regardless of what the Supreme Court does, regardless of what legislation passes, and we hope all that happens, but regardless of that, you can go volunteer at a pro-life pregnancy center. You can give your money to a pro-life pregnancy center. You can go help mentor a young woman in crisis. And, and just think about the power of um, a church coming around a young woman with her with their children, and not just not just during the birth process, but throughout their whole lives, and helping them raise those children uh, in the Lord, helping to raise them with stability and uh, comfort. And studies show that when children are raised in a healthy community like that, the outcomes are are really uh, much more positive. And so, really. Living on our pro-life principles is more than just speaking out every four years and two years. It's more than just, you know, if, if, if the only part of us being pro-life is being mad on Facebook, are we really doing anything about it? But we really should be, you know, rolling up our sleeves and uh, wherever God has called us. You know, and God calls people to different callings. Some may need to go start and fund a pregnancy resource center. Some may need to be people who work in, in the public policy arena. God may call some people to work in poverty alleviation to help the underlying conditions that um, lead to people making these decisions. Some people we need to go work uh, for uh, humanitarian organizations, and that's pro-life work as well. So it's, it's kind of a mosaic, depending on where your calling and gifting is. But if the only way we're pro-life is just being mad at the other guys, uh, that's, that's really not fully living out what it means to, uh, to be pro-life. So on the subject of, of being mad at the other guys, how can we constructively, lovingly, and with grace engage with our friends and neighbors who are pro-choice, who truly do believe that abortion is a net good for women? How do we engage in that conversation? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is apply our pro-life principles to the way we see people who disagree with us. So if we truly believe that every person is made in the image of God and has dignity and worth, that means the people across the aisle, the people who disagree with us, have dignity and worth. And one of the mistakes we make sometimes is we reduce people to that one argument we disagree with. We reduce people to their bad opinion or their bad argument, as if that's all they are. But they're whole people. And so when we stop seeing people as human beings and we just see them as sort of like avatars to be crushed or pixels online to be destroyed, um, we're really not living on our pro-life ethic. Uh, we need to be the kind of people who are firm in what we believe, who make arguments, who are courageous in that, but also willing to say, that person who disagrees with me has value and worth in the eyes of God. Um, and I think that goes a long way toward convincing people. You know, we're not just out here trying to own the other side, um, but we're here trying to make convince people, first of all, but also we're, we're representing Christ. You know, even in the political space, even when we're making policy arguments, it can be easy to lose sight of the fact that we're Christians, we, we're ambassadors for Christ, and we kind of shed all that. But the fruits of the Spirit matter in this case, too. And we should show the world not just a different argument, but a different way of arguing, a different way of making the case. I think of 1 Peter 3.15 where Peter says, have an answer for every person for the hope that lies within you, but do it with gentleness and civility, or gentleness and kindness. And Peter, you know, was not someone who was a shrinking violet by any stretch, right? Willing to pull out a sword, walk down the water, all that. Here he is saying, have courage to speak the truth and have an answer, but do it with gentleness. So, Courage and civility can coexist together, and that's what it means to uh, have a Christian witness. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dan. Well, thank you for having me. This has been great. And thank you for joining us as well. To learn more, you can go to swbts.edu. Until next time, live your calling.